Buenos dias, mis amigos. All right, so um, today I'm going to go um, over this list that I've started, and uh, I'm outing everybody. Okay, before I get into that, though, I want to address uh, these comments because I wanted to do that yesterday, and I, you know, I get the rambling and talking too much, and uh, so let me get this done first. Okay. Derek K1 says, Genuine question for you. The Hebrew manuscript said, slew Goliath in 2 Samuel 21, 19, and not slew the brother of Goliath. That much we can tell from the King James Bible itself. The brother of is in italics. So, is showing the correction in the margin notes any worse than showing the correction in the text itself? Alright, yeah, so, uh, what I say to this is the margin notes are like the serpent in the Garden of Eden when the serpent says, to Eve, yea, has God said, right? <clears throat> so, I would recommend a Bible that doesn't have margin notes. <laughs> I mean, to me, it's, it's very clear that you've got the Word of God, and then the margin notes are not the Word of God. Okay? So... Let me keep reading. Preserving the text as it was written in the manuscript and showing how it should be understood in the notes versus changing the text and letting the text read how it should be understood. I can see pros and cons of both. Okay. All right. So let me say it this way. What you're presupposing or imagining how whatever the right word is what you're imagining is that this Hebrew manuscript is the source of the Word of God and it's not let me do it this way because I I've done this a million times maybe not a million but probably a thousand times I'm gonna start off with this verse here that seems to get ignored incredible incredibly in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 8 whether there be tongues they shall cease the Hebrew is a tongue tongue in a language is the same thing and that language that tongue has ceased okay whether there be tongues they shall cease all right and then um oh my goodness okay how, i don't know how to do a short version of this so just bear with me here let me go over a couple of verses here in acts chapter 2 Verse 8, and how hear we, every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born. So we have the word of God in our own tongue. And that's actually promised to us. In Isaiah 59, verse 21 as for me, this is my covenant with them. This is a promise. Saith the Lord, My spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. All right, and so just bear with me. Keep an open mind, if you will.
Zephaniah 3, verse 9, For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. And this is speaking of the resurrection, the life to come hereafter. He will give us a pure language. All right, so like in 1 Corinthians 13, the, these languages that we speak today, they'll all be done away with. Just as we read in Genesis 11, when there was one language, the whole world was of one language and of one speech. God confounded the language, and now we have several languages. So languages come and go. But the word of the Lord endures forever. All right. Let me see if I can find that verse I'm thinking of. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall not pass away. All right. And so where does the word of God, where is the source of the word of God? Well, it, the, the, it, I mean, it's obvious. I admit, perhaps once you think about it, I guess, it should be obvious. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in ancient manuscripts. Oh, no, wait, I don't say that. Hold on a second. No. It says, forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. See, this is the difference between believing in God and believing in man, you scripts. Man comes from men. The word of God comes from God. All right, so that's the difference. And so that's what I strongly contend that all these people that point to the Hebrew, they all reject God because they don't believe the Word of God that they hold in their hands. Okay, now we could, I mean, if you wanted to get crazy and have a big, long discussion and all this sort of stuff, we can go into a, what, what manuscripts do you believe are from God. Because you got, what, the ancient Hebrew manuscripts? And Now, first of all, ancient Hebrew is not the same as modern Hebrew. You don't speak ancient Hebrew. Nobody's born into that language. It's a dead language. And then you got, what, Greek manuscripts? Which one of those Greek manuscripts do you believe? All right, and then you got, what do you... Some people I've heard say, well, there's some manuscripts are in Aramaic. So now i got to learn three languages to know what God says? I, there's no way. I barely know English. But it's the only language that I know. All right, and of course, this is amazing to me. Men With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and for all that... Will they not hear me, saith the Lord? Men of other tongues and other lips. So the word of God is not stuck in an ancient manuscript. The, well, this, the word of God is not, an Harry, uh, not a Harry Potter book. The word of God is God. The word of God is God. Yeah. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word of God is God. So, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. It's not just words on a piece of paper. The Word of God is God. 
The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints of marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This is not just something on a piece of paper from an old time. It's not from old time. The Word of God is not from the old time. Right? The Word of God is not from... Oh, prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The Word of God comes from God. Now, you want to make a big deal about the ancient Hebrew. Well, that's not the original. First of all, um, let's do it this way. First of all, Adam said something. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Adam said that. He didn't say that in ancient Hebrew. No. He said that in the original first language. And ancient Hebrew is not the original first language. All right, ancient Hebrew is not in any sort of way this one language that the whole world spoke. Uh, now, I don't know how in the, in the world people are so void of simple logic. It's amazing to me. The people want to say, well, maybe Hebrew was that one language, and then God just added these other languages. And so this is, I don't know how to say it without being, you know, kind of a jerk. But I think you're kind of a, a jerk when you, when you defy common sense, simple logic, okay? Because if, let's say, for example, there's one language on the earth and that language is English there's no other language just English and we all speak English now let's say God he confounds the language or he adds more languages Spanish Portuguese Chinese and all this other stuff and so let's say I travel to a far land and, and they're all speaking You know, uh, Japanese, whatever. Well, they they all spoke English too, right? So they just added they were added another language with them. Right? So God just added these languages. So let's see. I speak English. Do you speak English and Japanese? Well, to H E double hockey sticks with the Japanese. Let's all speak English. Why would we even bother with these added languages? Since we all speak English, let's all just keep on speaking English. These other languages are cool, but we all speak English. The only way for us to communicate is if we all speak English. No reason for us to learn these foreign languages when we all speak the same language. The idea that everybody spoke Hebrew and then God just added languages, it's nonsensical. You're trying too hard to imagine ancient Hebrew is God. Ancient Hebrew is not God. Ancient Hebrew is a dead language. You don't have to learn ancient Hebrew to know what God says. That's not That idea is not supported by the Bible at all. It doesn't support common sense. And what you're really saying is that God is not capable of speaking English. And that's 
I gotta watch my words here because sometimes I get nasty about that stuff because I view this as nasty stuff. To say that I gotta learn these foreign languages, at least three other foreign languages to know what God says. And because I can't and I won't, there's no possibility I'm too dumb. Now I gotta depend on you to tell me what God says? No, wait a second. Uh-uh, uh-uh. I ain't being fooled like that. I ain't your fool. There, no, not going to happen. I don't believe you. I'm going to believe the Word of God. <laughs> the Word of God. And that's the Bible that I have, that I hold in my hands. Okay. All right, so... Sometimes I ramble too much. I hope... I hope you understand. I hope somebody gets something from this. I hope somebody learns something from this. Edit. What I find interesting, not sure if it's in a good or bad way, LOL, is the, the Wycliffe Bible says a man given of God, or something to that effect, slew Goliath in both passages. And adds the note that this is David. And searching Elhanan, 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 and searching Elhanan, it also seems to mean given by God. All right, well, you know, the Wycliffe has its problems, and that might be one of them, okay? So, what is that? Second Samuel twenty-one nineteen. Second Samuel twenty-one nineteen. Second Samuel twenty-one nineteen. All right. So, God says there was a battle in Gob with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the sons of Jerokim, and a Bethlehemite. Slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite. The staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. I forget what he said over here. Wycliffe says a man given of God slew Goliath. Oh, I, I see. Uh... Yeah, no, it wasn't Goliath, right? That's the main thing. Uh, let's find it here. Let's find an easy, corrupt version. All right, so here, NASB, El Hanan, the son of Jerokim, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath. And the King James Bible says... Elhanan slew the brother of Goliath. What's in so in case, just in case you read here in the NASB Elhanan the son of Jero Okim I'm saying that wrong. I don't doubt that at all. The Bethlehemite killed Goliath. Oh I thought Boy I thought somebody else uh, who was that? I thought there was somebody else that killed Goliath. Wasn't there? Was it? Am I just not remembering correctly? Or was it David that killed Goliath? Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, it was David. So this is wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's very wrong and that's why Frank Logsdon um, Dr. Frank Logsdon who put together the NASB that's why he voiced concerns that he was in trouble with the Lord I'm afraid I'm in trouble with the Lord 
This is the guy that put together the NASB. Perhaps the most dramatic episode of the New Bible Movement has been the testimony of Dr. Frank Logston, a former pastor of the Moody Church in Chicago in the 1950s. Logsdon influenced the development of the New American Standard Bible. He had a 1887. They start on a feasibility report. And I encourage you to go ahead with it. I'm afraid I'm in trouble with the Lord. I encourage you to go ahead with it. We, we, we laid the groundwork. I wrote the format. I, I helped to interview some of the translators. I sat with the translators. I wrote the preface. When you see the New American Standard, they're my words. Well, when I got my copy, I mean, I, I never really looked at it. I just took for granted it was done as we started it, you know, until some of the country began to learn that I had some part in it, and they started saying, what about this? What about this? What about this? You had part in it. What, what about this? What about this? I got the place, and I said to Anne, I'm in trouble. I can't refute these arguments. They're, it's wrong. It's terribly wrong. It is frightfully wrong. And what am I going to do about it? He went through some real soul searching. This is the guy that put together the NASB. He got a rich friend of his to finance it. And he's the one that put all the people together to get this book written, published, and you know all that sort of stuff and then afterwards people came to him what about this what about that and this is probably one of the things that they showed Frank they said look it wasn't Elahanan that killed Goliath all the even the school kids know that they everybody knows it was David so why does the NASB say it was somebody else What's wrong? It's very wrong. Now, um, well, okay, so I probably went on too long about this. I'm not sure what point I was going to make with that, unless it was just that. Oh, the Whitcliffe. The Whitcliffe. Um, you're just curious what the Whitcliffe says here. Their battle god Philistines, a battle man given of God. Uh, the son of a forest, an embroiderer, or a man of Bethlehem smote the brother of Goliath. Okay. All right. Doesn't say all oh, right there. In which battle? Wait, what does that say? I can't understand all this crap here. What is this? N M in parentheses. All this sort of goofy stuff. Who in the world? All right. I, this stuff drives me nuts, man. Why, why not just... Oh, oh! but the King James is so hard to read. We got to... You know, the, the King James Bible is the easiest, simplest to read. It's not even close. I could get into that, too, but... I'm afraid I'm getting too far off track. I appreciate that, Derek K. Juan. That's a good question. I'll have to write a response here. Uh, I think about it a little bit. Do not listen to this pathetic misinformation from someone who has no clue. Oh, that's for you guys. That's not for me. I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure he's talking to you guys. Pathetic misinformation. All right, because. Um, it's okay to reject the Bible that you hold in your hands. It's okay to not trust the Word of God, right? Okay, and then also, it's okay to reject the idea that Jesus can give you everlasting life. That's just misinformation. Don't listen to me, which I would actually agree with. I would strongly encourage you to 
believe the Bible that you hold in your hands. And then number three, those that put their hope into a bonus thousand years. I, I tell you what, I tell you what, I get a little bit of, I got a fire under my rear end. And it's these people that push this idea that you don't have to believe in Jesus right now. You can wait until after Jesus comes. Then you got a thousand years. You're going to be living longer. There's going to be peace on earth. Then you then you're going to believe. Then you that's your chance to believe. Don't believe now. Just ignore everything. Don't doesn't matter. Jesus comes and then there's a thousand years and then you can make up your mind. That burns my rear end. Because you cannot wait. Yeah, I mean, once Jesus comes, it's the end of the world. If you're not saved, that's it. You're done forever. You will die the second death. There is no, no more opportunity. The Bible is very clear about that. Even when the wrath of God is being poured upon this world and people are dodging you know brimstone and and trying to hide under rocks and all that and trying to dodge the fire that there's no chance for them to get saved when they see the fire of god coming down on them there is no opportunity for them to get saved it's too late it's way too late. You have to believe before there's any sign of the Lord Jesus in the clouds of heaven. If you wait, it's too late. Because at that moment, it's over. It's, it's uh, triple zeros, right? Time's out. There is no more opportunity to get saved. So what are you doing preaching this idea that, well, there's a bonus thousand years? Yeah, I want, you know, that's why I encourage people to talk about what, is, what, are, what in the world, what is this sexual fantasy of yours? You're going to be in your glorified body and having children? Well, let's talk about that. Are you going to be the P. Diddy of the thousand years? Huh? I mean, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. I mean, you talk about it, right? I want to hear you talk. I want to hear your ideas. Uh, why, why hide it? Why are you not revealing your ideas about this thousand years? You said there's peace. There's Satan's locked up and there's no sin. And there's children being born. Well, let's talk about that. Because all those things are contrary to what the Bible actually says. All right, so let's hear your, uh, what's the opposite of misinformation? Let's hear your information. Let's hear your sound doctrine, if you will, what you strongly believe. And specifically, Craven, I want to hear you talking about how many children you're going to be making during this thousand year period I want you to talk about that and how many wives will you have all right and then of course when you're being fruitful with your wife or whoever whoever it is that you think you're you know, fulfilling your fantasies with. Uh, I want you to talk. Are you going to be in your twenty-year-old body? I, you know, I'm an old man, right? So I, for me, I'm fifty-four years old. So if you're fifty-four now, will you be fifty-four for a thousand years? And per, you know, being fruitful with the wife, and talk about that stuff. I mean, why? What? What are you ashamed of? If that's what you believe, talk about it. Of course, I'm going to, again, I'm not going to stop, make it very clear 
that that's against everything in the Bible. That's pure evil, pure wickedness, and it's based on lust. In 1 John chapter 2, John writes, The world passes away and the lust thereof. So when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, there is no more sex. Well, what are you ashamed of? You don't want to talk about that? It, and not just you, Craven, but all these pastors that preach this idea of a thousand years, they want to set up the scenario of this sexual fantasy of theirs. They don't want to talk about the sex. Why? Well, it's because they're ashamed. And deep down in their soul, they know it's wrong. It's very wrong. But I know and you know, we all know that you're thinking about it. You're thinking about this time just like it was in the days of Noah, right? Because they lived almost a thousand years, didn't they? Before the floods came, right? And they took them wives of all which they chose, right? And then the flood waters came and killed them all. And so also is this world reserved unto fire. Right? So when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, he will come as a thief in the night in the which the heaven shall pass away with a fervent, uh, with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. The works, all this hanky-panky, it's going to be done away with. And I'm telling you right now, I don't want everlasting life full of hanky-panky. I want something much better. And that's what we're going to get. Those of us that are truly saved, we will get eternal life that is far greater than the hanky-panky that we suffer in this world. Now, of course, there was no hanky panky right before Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that hanky panky is a curse because they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and that hanky panky will be done away with when Jesus stomps his foot on a head of the serpent destroying all evil forever right so there won't be no more hanky panky after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven even Jesus says in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are as the angels of heaven as the spirits of God right there is no sex what do you think? Well, we're not going to be married. We're just going to be having sex with everybody. Just not getting married. Oh, is that what you're thinking? And you're wrong. You're wrong. You're way wrong. Okay. Let's get back on topic here. Jesus reigns forever. There we go. S-E-K-4110. That's right. Don't forget about it. Don't listen to these liars that say, Oh, well, Jesus reigned for a thousand years. He's going to come down on the earth and reign for a thousand years. What? What comic book did you read that? Because it's not in the Bible. Right? It, it's not. I, I don't know how in the world do you miss it. It's amazing to me. It's astonishing. It's a phenomenon. Really. First of all, first of all, Jesus reigns forever. I mean, one simple verse makes that very clear. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there is no end. There shall be no end. That's not a thousand years, buddy. That's forever. So we go to Revelation 20. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Well, wait a second. Okay, so first of all, it doesn't say Jesus reigns a thousand years. That should be that should be simple. That should be easy to see. Now, what's interesting here is that it says they lived and reigned. They shall be priests of God and of Christ. Shall reign a thousand years. So, those people 
they only reign a thousand years? Is that what it says? It, well, they 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 reign they only, they reign with Christ. They only they reign with Christ only a thousand years. It's not forever, right? And so I don't want this idea of this thousand year period. I don't want no part of it. I want something greater than a thousand years. I want everlasting life, life that lasts forever. So what is this talking about? It's only for a thousand years that they live and reign with Christ. Well, you know what? It's interesting because when we actually consider the vision, we see that we are partakers of the first resurrection, right? That we are partakers of the Lord Jesus Christ, for he is the resurrection, right? Because he's the resurrection, we are partakers of his resurrection. Jesus even says, I am the resurrection. Right? So in Revelation 20, when it says, Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. We are partakers of his resurrection. Right? And we could go to multiple places and confirm this, that Jesus is the first fruits of them that slept. Christ, the first fruits, afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. All right, so Jesus is the first resurrection. Then we are resurrected at his coming when he comes in the clouds of heaven. So he's the first resurrection. He even says, I am the resurrection. And the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. In Revelation chapter 1, it even says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. Huh? That means he's the first resurrection. How do you miss that, man? Well, when you preach these comic book doctrines and you trust what other men say, you're not going to see it even though it's right there in front of your face. And you don't deserve to see it because you don't believe God. You deserve to be, to be delusional. All right, so good job, S-E-K. That means a lot to me because, honestly, frankly, I don't. I don't know if anybody sees it, and I, I don't. Be, I don't. I think people don't see it, even though it's laid out plainly in front of them. I think they can't see it because they don't believe. And this is another reason, more evidence to me, that we live in a world full of deceivers, and very, very few today are actually saved. I was going to talk a lot of. I was going to talk about that. Uh, in my opinion, the majority of uh, the saved people, in my opinion, are older people. If there are, let's say, for example, a thousand people in the world today saved, the majority, overwhelming majority, probably in their 80s. That's what I think. And very few people, very few, if any, people in their 20s are saved if any that's what I think okay so I was, I'm not going to talk about that today but uh, maybe in the future if there is even the opportunity in the future if the world don't come to an end which it could today all right Craven M 1980 says also the 70 week that's taught by Matt The map must be somebody in the video. I don't know. 
using actual biblical proof has not happened. Oh, Jesus didn't die, did he? He does. He didn't bring in everlasting righteousness. That Jesus did nothing. Okay. All right. That's what you believe. That's fine. You're gonna find out the hard way. And he actually uses the Bible to prove this to you in several ways, except he doesn't at all. But. You choose to believe what someone else who was told by someone else who didn't study has said. Oh, but you're leaning on Matt, and I'm leaning on the Bible. That's interesting. You're leaning on what Matt said, and then accusing me of leaning on somebody else. Well, let's go straight to the source. The Let's go to God. Let's ask God, the Word of God. And this is the Word of God. Here in Daniel chapter 9, I mean, this is easy peasy, simple stuff. For those of us that have eyes to see, this is plain as day. All right, so the angel, or the, the you know, am I saying that right? Is it fair to say angel? I was thinking about that last night. Where am I at here? Oh, never mind. What? Gabriel, all right. I don't want to get all into a whole big thing on that. It's just that's another side thing. Don't worry about that. Let's just scratch that from the record. Gabriel says to Daniel, "Consider the vision. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression." and to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy to anoint the most holy. Now, Jesus doesn't do that. He hasn't done that. He never did that. In fact, the Antichrist, he's going to come... And he's going to be a kid that has a 666 tattoo on his top of his head. He's going to be born that way. It's going to be a birthmark, actually. A birthmark. It's going to be 666 on the top of his head. You won't be able to see it once his hair grows out. But that'll be the Antichrist. And he'll come in and he'll make an end of sins. He'll finish the transgression. He'll make reconciliation for iniquity. And he'll bring in everlasting righteousness. According to Matt Craven and... Wait, isn't Craven Matt? Isn't that your name, Matt? Yeah, I'm not sure. It doesn't matter. I that hasn't happened yet. Also, the 70th week, as taught by Matt, using actual biblical proof, has not happened. hasn't happened yet well that's interesting because if, if it hasn't happened yet there should be a whole lot of information about it in the New Testament well it's interesting because there is a whole lot of information about this in the New Testament which makes it easy and obvious that the Lord Jesus Christ has done it it's already done. He did it. When he bowed his head and said, It is finished, it's done. He done it. Sorry, buddy, I didn't mean to scare you. Alright, so he I mean he I don't know how in the world you look at this and say, Oh well that's Jesus didn't do that. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy holy people I'm sorry, upon thy people and upon thy holy city. To finish the transgression and to make it, Jesus didn't make an end of sense. Are you crazy? There's something wrong with your heart. Now, I think uh, what happens is we live in a world where people are have short attention spans, and so once they get to the next verse, they completely forget everything that was just said right there. And now they're imagining, you know, Batman and Scooby Doo and all. And, you know, Dolly Parton and all these, you know, distractions. 
And then they get down here and they're like, oh yeah, I remember Reverend Smitty. He said the Antichrist was going to come and confirm a covenant. I saw John Hagee say the Antichrist is going to come make make a covenant with Israel. I can't use my brain to function at all. And I just, whatever John Hagee says and Reverend Smitty, well, that much, well, you know, don't tell you, you can't trust God. You can't trust the Word of God. You go, got to go back to the ancient manuscripts that don't exist. And that you couldn't read even if they did exist. I mean, what in the world is wrong with people? Honest to God, I don't. You know, this, this is why. I'm more and more convinced every day that there are very, very few people on the earth that are saved today because of all these people that are so clearly deceived. The Word of God is very plain and very easy to see on this. Jesus has done it. And so when we get, to, for example, to verse 27, He shall confirm the covenant with many in one week, for one week, okay? That's Jesus. He brought us a better covenant. A better covenant based on better promises. Right? Is that anywhere in the Bible? Oh, yeah. Hebrews 8, verse 6. But now has he obtained a more excellent ministry. By how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises and he shall confirm the covenant well you can't connect the dots man there's something wrong with your heart hey i i, I could say well there's something wrong with your brain for sure something wrong with your heart if you can't see that and i contend i strongly contend it's because you don't believe the word of god this is so plain and simple right in front of your eyes and you can't see it? There's something wrong with your heart. Even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Right? People are blind until they believe. And once they believe, then the veil is taken away and their eyes are open and they can see. And they will be healed by the Lord Jesus. All right. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. All right. So he is the one. Jesus is the one that laid down his life. He is the sacrifice that is worthy to be, uh, which is good enough for God. All right. So the, the, the blood of, of bulls and goats was never good enough right okay I feel like I'm going on just a little bit too long that's the way I feel all right so for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins all right yeah, so it's Jesus who who uh, became sin. Let's see if I could, how quick I could be with this here. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Right? That's not the verse that I wanted, but that's good enough because that applies also. All right, so let's go back here. To me, it's just, it's absolutely insane. It's just a clear example <clears throat> of people that are blind. Even though it's right there in front of my eyes, right there in front of your eyes, and right there in front of their eyes, they can't see what is so very simple to see for those of us with eyes to see. Okay, so... Jesus is the one that caused the sacrifice when he laid down his life as the perfect sacrifice for our sins, not ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. 
All right, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. All right, so all those things are done away with. And then the consummation is the marriage coming together. Uh, uh, it's, how do I say this? It's when we are lifted up, when we are transformed into our glorified body. It's when the bride comes into the groom. Um, you know, in a sense, it's spiritual hanky-panky. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. All right, so it, what it is is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, we are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and when the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Uh, this is the consummation when we are changed from corruptible into incorruptible, from mortal into immortality. Or, in, or immortal. All right, so we're going to be changed in a moment when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. We're going to be lifted up into the air to meet the Lord in the air. We're going to be transformed into our glorified body at that moment. That is the consummation. All right. And then that determined shall be poured upon the desolate is the wrath of God being poured upon the unsaved. Just as we read in Genesis 3. When the Lord said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That's the fulfillment. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, that's the fulfillment of this right here in Genesis 3, verse 15. The fulfillment is when Jesus comes, we are lifted up out of this world, out of, off the earth, and then all the unsaved, the seed of the serpent, all evil will be destroyed forever. And Jesus will make all things new. All right. Okay. All right. So I appreciate that. Let's keep moving here. Let's keep it moving. Moving on down the line here. Oh, another one by... Craven M, 1980. Excellent. All right. I love it. Love it. First, you do not know this man, and he is being humble by lying to us, by saying it is how he sees it, and the truth don't matter, right, Craven? The hell with the truth. You can imagine, do whatever you want. It's interesting to me, and maybe I'm not being fair. Sometimes I get a little bit, you know, I get a little bit jacked up get a little bit in front of myself and all that sort of stuff and sometimes I make mistakes no question about it but here in Genesis 6 verse 5 God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of a, the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually now you know what's interesting here if we go to the New Testament as it was in the days of Noah so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man now, you remember that? Remember that Matthew 24 in Luke 17? As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. All right, so when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it's going to be the way it is. Is the way, the way it was back then, it's the way it's going to be when Jesus comes. And I contend that's the way it is now. If Jesus, there, And I'll tell you right now, there's nothing stopping Jesus from coming today. Right, And therefore, if what I say is true, then the way it is today is like the way it was in the days of Noah before the flood came. Right? So in other words, when it says, God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, that's the way it was back then, and then therefore that's the way it is right now. And so here's an example for why I believe that. You have this guy imagining, here, let me read what he says so I don't lose my train of thought here. First, you do not know this man, and he is being humble by saying it is how he sees it, which is what the Bible says. 
you have a twisted view of God's word that is deceiving and very, very dangerous. If you want to know the truth, and it's very, very dangerous if you want to know the truth. Wait, let me read that again. You have a twisted view of God's word that is deceiving and very, very dangerous if you want to know the truth. You are just one of those guys that like to try to bully your way through others' teachings when you don't understand anything yourself. So, you think I'm bullying people, and so there you're going to write all these messages and flood the comment section, and you're going to imagine that that's not bullying. You're not bullying. You're not doing what you're accusing me of. It's interesting because you do, you're exactly doing what you're accusing me of. And I want to encourage you, Craven, make your own videos. Present your own thoughts. Huh? What did you do? Like your own comment? That's brilliant. See, that's... Maybe you didn't. All right, so... Uh, no, I appreciate that. I pretty, You know, the criticism really helps make me sharp. But burns a, a fire under my butt. And it helps me to be sharp. To make sure I know exactly what it is... That I'm teaching and preaching. Right? So I appreciate that. Now, uh, now again, I, I'm not sure what I was going to say here. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And, alright, so I, I think I made my point. I'm not even sure here. If I did, if I didn't, I apologize. Uh, Humility form, Revelation 20, uh, 4 through 6. Listening to one say it's not of the Bible. When it was on my heart, made me check. You are right. Saints won't rule only, I'm sorry. Saints won't rule only reign with him. He will rule with an iron rod. All right, so well, that's interesting. I, I'm perceiving that as somebody who sees it. Um, that's what I'm perceiving here. Us versus the world. All right, country bumpkin. All right. Four videos? I only see one. Oh, that's the other three. All right, cool. All right, very cool. Now, um, yeah, no, it's interesting. Uh, I, it's incredible, really. You hear people say, "Oh, Jesus is gonna reign and rule for a thousand years." That's what the Bible says, but the Bible doesn't say that at all. And this comic book doctrine stuff needs to be called out. Problem is. All the local churches are teaching this idea of a bonus thousand years. So how? what can you do? You can't do nothing. The very few of us that are saved, we're surrounded by the enemy. In every direction. What can we do? You know, I guess the only thing, the best idea I got is to do a video... I get about 10 people to watch, and then, you know, nine of them are looking to accuse me of being a bully and spreading misinformation. That's all I can do, right? The, these guys, their view is the dominant view in the local churches all around the world. The 2.4 billion people that claim to be Christians today, over 2.3 billion of them believe the same thing that Craven M. 1980 believes. But I'm the bully. I'm the bully. I'm the one that's very, very dangerous. It's interesting. 
It's interesting. Okay, so oh, here we go. Look at look at this guy, man. He's on a tear. That away. Exactly. This guy's a fake, a charlatan, a deceiver. He knows no truth. Oh, there we go. Wow, you got to call out the bully, don't you? And just flood my comment section. I like it, man. Thanks. Appreciate that. I know he's talking about me. He's not talking about Shane. I don't know what's going on in this conversation here, honestly. This is from four days ago, but Craven, he's jumping in. He's mad. He mad because I'm not like everybody else. He mad about that. All right, let's. I got a some a notification here, fellas. Alpha. All right, so this guy's he's walking on eggshells, having this conversation with me, but. He's not backing down. I don't know why. But he's not flooding the comments either. One comment at a time. I appreciate that. Um, I agree. And this chapter also shows how everyone's faith transforms into work. See, Noah. Right. Right. So. Um, I'll have to. I'll, I'll respond to that later. Uh. Because I'm sure you're not going to know the, the... So what Alpha is saying is that uh, we um, must keep the law. Here we go. No? There we go. So he's saying that the law of Christ is the same thing as the law of Moses. And I had to walk him through that so he could see it. All right, and so, and then so I had to just gently nudge him. All right, slow walk him through this thought process that, hey, all right, Moses brought us the law, and then Jesus, he sort of helps define the law and let us understand that it's not just going out and committing the act, it's the heart. Right? The problem is the human heart. The problem isn't going out and acting upon what's in your heart. The problem is the heart. And so that's what Jesus does. And so uh, this idea that, well, you got to keep the law. Well, according to Moses, you can't kill. But then according to Jesus, you can't have the thought in your heart. All right, same thing with adultery and so on and so forth. And uh, all that law does is show us that we need a Savior because none of us can keep the law. All right, now, all of us that are born of God, we want to keep the law. Because we know that we are wicked and in need of a Savior. We want to be good. But we know that we can't be good. We know that we need a Savior. And that's why we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's um, ultimately, ultimately, it's on God to choose us. We can't save ourselves no matter what. No matter what, we are 100% at the mercy of God, but God does promise to save us, to choose us, and to bring unto us, onto us, the, His Spirit, the Spirit of God. Therefore, when we are born of the Spirit of God, we have eternal life, life that lasts forever. Those of us today, the very few of us that are actually saved, we are born of the Spirit of God. We have the Spirit of God in us, and we shall never die. There's nothing that can ever change that. And so that's what I'm hoping Alpha Studios, LH1RZ, can figure out. 
that hey Alpha you need a savior your works aren't gonna save you all right your works compared to the works of God nothing like tampons your good works nothing they don't mean nothing. What do you think you're going to impress God? Oh, look at me, God. I walked an old lady across the street. I deserve heaven. And you think about Matthew 7. People doing many wonderful works in the name of Jesus. Right? And let's compare that with what Alpha says. Right? Faith transforms into many wonderful works. See, my faith, I got lots of money and lots of faith, and I do lots of wonderful works. And then Jesus is going to profess unto them. I never knew you. You think your good works are going to save you? You're in trouble. You're in big trouble. All right, that's it for today. I talk too much, man. No question about it. I talk way too much. I think that's it for all the comments. I do appreciate them. Oh, oh goodness sakes. This channel is a joke. You reading Matthew something or another. Dude knows nothing about how... Ooh, that's why you're, that's why you're being held for a review. That's, that's a no-no. That's an absolute no, no. I don't like being called a turd. I am so offended. Therefore, that is one of the words that I put in my settings to hold for review because I will not allow that in my comment section. The word dude is a no, no. This channel is a joke. You reading Matthew something or another. Dude knows nothing but how to do Google search. He doesn't know the Bible J joke. All right. A good comment there, Craven. M1980. Appreciate that. Yes, this dude is of the devil. Dude. Dude. I mean, dude. Come on, dude. Let's go smoke some doobies, dude. Really. It, it's time to grow up. It's time to grow up. And I'm telling you right now, the Bible, I take it very serious.